Google owns Kaggle, and they give you 37 free hours of GPU time per week. And when you run out, Google will try to steer you to its AI cloud product. I think most of the contenders, the guys who ride the leaderboard, they own their own GPU setups. And I think the widely quoted observation is it's break even between cloud and rolling your own GPU rig after about a year of continued use. I'd like to offer a third option, which is AWS, Amazon Web Services. I'm not their friend. I've never worked for them. Um, I'm as loath to give them money as you are. But I think if you have AWS credits lying around, then it makes a lot of sense to do Kaggle through AWS. Also, Google Cloud Engine, if you're like a oblivious customer and a new customer on Google Cloud Engine who just wants to run some non-Kaggle experiments on a GPU, uh, requisitioning a GPU without a record of past business seems hard to impossible. You'll see on the uh, GCE discussion at googlegroups.com mailing lists all sorts of people like myself just wondering like, hey, I tried to spin up a VM instance and it keeps refusing me on this particular region for GPU. And the moderators on that list sort of throw their hands up and say, well, just call your sales rep. And we're students. We're middle-aged Asians living with our parents. Uh, hashtag tech lead. Hashtag tech lead's brother. And so talking to sales reps, that's not what we do. And AWS does not seem to have this problem. So we start by installing the Emacs IPython notebook. Now, there's an ongoing competition with the company Lyft. It's a motion prediction task. And one of the more highly voted notebooks is Juan Vo's notebook. It's very well done. Shout out to Juan Vo and his tidy score of 23.6. Let's copy it to our laptop. Um, OK. And those who are accustomed to the Emacs IPython notebook will know to open the IPYNB file as normal and then hit Control C O. That will uh, prompt you to start a notebook server locally. And I'm assuming you've installed Jupyter on your laptop. OK. Now, there are a number of things you have to do to massage a Kaggle notebook so that we can run it in Emacs and run it in AWS. So the chief task is data sets. And Kaggle sort of has it all very nice and user friendly with its input data and its pointing and clicking of and attaching of folders and competition data sets. Um, there, there are those of you who actually have tried uh, to run a Kaggle notebook in AI Cloud, Google's AI Cloud product. And it's sort of interesting to note how Google does it. Um, they do it better than I would, but it's still sort of a hack. So I have the notebook teed up here and in Kaggle. And I'll upgrade to Google AI Notebooks. And I'll accept the default settings. I have to check the box that says install the GPU driver. This is the nature of cloud. Everything takes forever. This is like a scene from Office Space. Oh, for Pete's sake. So there's a problem at Google HQ. Kaggle Python kernels just don't work. If not globally, then at least for my particular account. I've sent a mail to GCE discussion at Google Groups, and I, uh, since it's the weekend, I don't expect to get a response, at least for a couple days. Um, but what I wanted to show you, and I can right now, is that when you do eventually spin up a VM instance with the Kaggle uh, Python image, the opening JupyterLab uh, cell will have this, in big capital letters, it'll say, you know, execute this first cell that we're giving you uh, to properly import your Kaggle data sets, and then you can delete the cell. And so it's very clearly a hack. Um, the awkward and slow modus operandi of cloud software is such that even at a big company like Google, um, the awkwardness exposes itself. I recently got into a podcast called Co Recursive. Uh, what drew me to it was Brian Kernigan's interview um, where he talked about punch cards and the old and actually pretty glorious days uh, at Bell Labs. And I've got to say that the current cloud regime or the move towards cloud really reminds me of punch cards where you, know, you would submit your code to 
In the 1970s, it was a punch card operator. Today, it's the cloud. Both entities are opaque, pithy, sort of slow to get back to you. And there's, there's no tight feedback loop. And when they did get back to you, at least for the first several tries, you know, the punch card operator would say, well, you, you didn't get your, the results you wanted because you messed up the semicolon. And that's sort of the state we're in now. I guess the more things change, the more they stay the same. So back to importing data sets. Well, go to the instructions in the README, uh, this link right here. We will follow the instructions and insert code from the example. Our competition is not this. This is just an example. Our competition is lift motion prediction autonomous vehicles. OK. And um, it turns out that Juan Vo's notebook also imports his own personal data set. So uh, there's instructions for personal data sets as well at the web page for Dick Mao Kagler. We'll copy that example. OK. Um, on Vo, um, left, let's see, oops. Right. All good in the hood. Now, ordinarily, Kagglers are accustomed to seeing their data in a directory called slash Kaggle slash input. Since we're running in our own scheme, we're putting it in slash var slash temp. So we need to replace all occurrences of slash Kaggle slash input with uh, var temp. OK, so uh, once for the competition data set and once for the user data set. Now we're ready to rock and roll. We're going to submit this baby to the cloud. We're submitting it to the punch card operator and hoping for a benign response. From the readme, it says to, from the notebook, run metax ian get run remote. From the notebook, ian get run remote. And now it's installing the get utility. Get is, if you know anything about uh, Cromwell at the Broad Institute, uh, get is sort of a poor man's version of Cromwell. Um, it sort of does all the um, dirty work of getting things to run in the cloud. Um, now this is where things will fail for you because I've only tested it on Linux and because that's the platform that I exclusively run on. I know very little about Windows. I know just a little bit more about OS X and I suspect since I haven't tested on either platform, it will probably fail for some niggling reason which I hope you'll figure out on your own. So uh, the install succeeded and now I'm being asked to enter, uh, you know, Jupyter sort of has this security protocol. Um, I'll just say no password for now. Confirm no password. I'll specify an AWS instance type. Um, for, for like poor man's GPU, well, poor man is relative. Obviously, if you can afford AWS, then you're really ahead of the game, broadly speaking. Uh, but for GPU, cheaper GPU instances, I go with an older generation G3S.xlarge, which supports either a K60 or K80 or M60 GPU, not one of the fancy, uh, more expensive uh, V100s or P100s. OK, now you have to make an important choice here. So I'm offering three uh, bespoke Docker images. The one that will support this particular competition, because uh, the Lyft competition is using L5 kit, which is PyTorch based. So I want to use uh, Dick Mao slash PyTorch GPU. And now uh, things are rolling. Oh, not yet. So now we have to write the Docker file. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, you know, I barely know Emacs. I barely know cloud stuff. And now you're asking me to write a Docker file. Uh, it's too much, brah. And you know, it's a lot like that scene from 40-Year-Old Virgin when Kevin Hart walks into the store, gets reprimanded, and he, he says, you know, you're throwing a lot of big words at me. I'm going to take it as disrespect. And it's true. I am throwing a lot of information at you. And it may not be worth it for you to learn it. But if you're serious about improving your software life and having the power to change things to make your life easier in the long run, then I feel like now is a good time as any to start learning it. So editing the Docker file. Um, it comes preset with the proper from. We just chose the PyTorch GPU. And uh, it comes preset with the embedding, the copying of the notebook to our Docker image. Uh, what we'll have to add is the various uh, pip install invocations that ordinarily uh, get 
inserted into the notebook via exclamation point pip install. Uh, that practice is fine, except that uh, adding it to your notebook via exclamation point pip install means that every time you instantiate a notebook, it has to reinstall the Python library. Whereas if you just add it here, run pip install l5 kit, it will bake it into the Docker image. And so it'll always be there every time you open the notebook. And that's always a nice uh, little speed up. Now, Kaggle makes this somewhat easier through the utility script feature where you can write a utility script and then like you can add a pip install to ut your utility script and then drag and drop it into your notebook. Here, we do things more command line, more bare bones, because that's how we roll. And uh, over time, you'll learn to appreciate how much more efficient it is to uh, put things in a Docker file. Hit Control CC to save. OK, it's doing Docker stuff to upload it to AWS. Uh, we, we have an error. <laughs> OK, the error is insufficient instance capacity. There is no spot capacity available um, that matches your request. So what this means for anyone familiar with AWS is that there's no spot, there's, there's no sort of cheap instance uh, instances available to run a g3s.xlarge is the instance type that we chose. So this means we have to up our GPU game. Uh, we got to spend we got to spend some coin to uh, get a G GPU instance that has uh, capacity. Um, we'll, we'll rerun emdat run remote on the notebook. No password for now. Um, so now uh, the next step up is like a p2 um, p2 dot x large. Uh, I think this is like a. Well, I'm not going to be. I don't want to get quoted on what GPU that is, but I think it's a, it's slightly more powerful than uh, what we were going to use. Okay. Okay. So the instance state pending is always a good sign. So similar to uh, our our fun experience with Google AI Cloud and the waiting and so forth, uh, you know AWS isn't exactly uh, light speed either. So this is sort of the state of the world now with uh, cloud uh, cloud deployment. And what's happening now is uh, this new instance that we've spun up needs to now Docker pull our image. And our image is big. Our image has all the PyTorch stuff on it. Um, it's really the PyTorch is, is, is like eight gig. So the, the Docker image is large. OK, so our notebook is up. It's on this IP address, uh, 3 point, I'm pointing with my finger, you can't tell. Uh, 3 point, I'm pointing at the bottom line, 3.21.44.93 is our VM instance on AWS. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, now we can put things to the test. We're going to uh, execute, we're going to input the data set. And this is going to take forever. Now, the reason why it didn't take forever for me is because I've already done this uh, sometime in the past. And so I've already cached the Lyft data set, the competition data set, to my uh, EFS drive on AWS. And after you've done it the first time, you too will have cached the data set to your EFS drive, assuming that your region supports AWS EFS. So uh, my point is that you have to be prepared to wait a, a very long time for this cell to uh, execute the first time around, because that lift uh, data set is massive. Uh, now that we've gotten over the hump uh, of importing the data sets according to our way of doing things, not the Kaggle way of doing things on GCE, but rather the Emacs IPython notebook way of doing things on AWS, we can, well, you know, we can do our we can do our analysis. Alt Enter uh, executes a cell and goes to the next one. So even with our fairly speedy GPU, uh, training will take some time. And for the purposes of this tutorial, we don't need to wait for that. So we should ian, ian colon stop. Uh, this is asking us to stop the local instance of Jupyter, which we don't have to do. Our local instance is not costing us anything, except electricity bills. Um, this is asking us to stop the remote uh, instance. And we'll say yes to that. We'll save our notebook, uh, even though that notebook is unfinished. And the, the Jupyter instance has been terminated. So you're wondering, OK, uh, I've done all this work. Where are the results? Well, the results are in a file called, uh, so in your working directory where you had the notebook and your Docker file, there should be a subdirectory called run remote, which, um, let's see, uh, mount rep run remote. S3FS. Um, Try is a technology, it's called the file system in user space, and it tries to make an S3 bucket in the cloud 
look like a, rem a remotely mounted directory on your laptop. And the technology is a bit touch and go. Um, files will not appear or appear uh, at unexpected times. Um, there's a lot of latency. And uh, you know it's not great, but it's sort of the best we could do. In that directory will be, in a nutshell, all, all your results. So not only does it have the uh, notebook that we saved and modified, uh, it also has whatever uh, outputs uh, the notebook created, whether they be files or images or whatnot. OK, now uh, one last thing. We'll go back to our the notebook uh, as it was created locally. I personally like to run experiments in a non-interactive fashion, what's called offline or batch mode. And say, for instance, I wanted to change the learning rate from 0.01 to, say, 0.02. Well, you know, I, at this point, I kind of have things nailed down. I know this notebook runs. And so I'd like to just run it front to back in AWS using AWS's computing power and GPUs. Uh, but I, I want to run it sort of non-interactively, and I just want to get the results. So the way to do that is to run even get run remote batch. And what that will do is rather than launch an interactive notebook on AWS, it will use the NB convert software to uh, take this notebook and run it front to back just like a Python script. So people who are familiar with the Jupyter ecosystem are well aware of what uh, NB convert does. None of this software works. It's not even alpha quality. It's like pre-alpha quality. I mean, I use it myself because I offer the software to expect my personal configuration, which is, you know, Golang 1.13, a vanilla Ubuntu environment, vanilla Emacs. I don't test it on other platforms or Doom or Space Max. And so my hope is that someone out there will use it and report back on what doesn't work because I am sure there's a ton of stuff that just doesn't.